just start in just a moment. Rex from New York, thank you for joining us. Thanks for, for connecting. We've got folks from all over connected, so great to see you all today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jen. I am Marketing Director at Calcium, and we would love to hear where you're from, any questions that you had, like I said, related to hypertensive patients and their care management. Uh, this is going to include some Q&A and discussion, so we want to include any of your concerns, questions, thoughts throughout this presentation. Um, and with that said, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Kathy Kenworthy. Kathy has founded Health Hippo, and it's based on the belief that well-structured info has the power to transform industries, and it's more than time for that transformation in healthcare. Kathy, Kathy also serves as president of Conceivabilities, which is a fast-growing agency that's helped intended parents start families. Kathy's passion for driving change delivers breakthrough growth, productivity, and in impact with a focus on customers. She invests her time in board service with a lot of organizations, Kathy. Very impressive list. And she's also a fellow of the Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellowship Program. With all that said, Kathy, we would love to welcome you to today's presentation. Thank you for joining us to talk about um, hypertension and sharing all of your experiences uh, with, with, uh, with us and the audience. Welcome, Kathy. Jen, thank you so much, and uh, I'm very, uh, very excited to be able to speak about this. I do want to start by just saying that I recognize that I'm speaking to a lot of care providers, and I myself am not a um, physician, uh, but I am extremely curious about this topic of um, information and how uh, you know, the, the language that's been prevalent in healthcare for so many years of consumerism and shared decision making and people taking accountability for their health, how might that actual vision come to life if we um, kind of even the playing field and put patients in a position where they're somewhat more on par with um, their, um, uh, you know, shared decision makers, uh, providers with regard to what's known and what's not known about specific health issues here, our example today being hypertension. So I wanna start by um, uh, offering this idea that patient empowerment is different than something called patient engagement and um, maybe even a darker X through a word that's not even written on the slide called patient compliance. Um, all of us perhaps know by this point with regard to hypertension that, you know, no one, none of us are capable of forcing someone else to take the pill, forcing someone else to do a thing or work down, uh, work, work on a treatment path um, that they've not actually bought into. And so uh, if we were to potentially explore really what the theme of uh, perhaps this webinar is about, what, what might empowerment really look like um, with regard to hypertension? And, and we've chosen hypertension as our example, as our working example here today, um, for no other reason than it, it, if we can't do it in hypertension, I wonder where we might be able to do it. Hypertension is one of the longest described health issues in modern medicine. I believe the first um, description of uh, blood pressure started in the year 1733. Um, I think there's widespread consensus among providers about um, management of this condition and what the component parts are. But as we see in this chart, hypertension is largely out of control. Um, you know, more than 100 million Americans um, are, are identified as being hypertensive. Um, and many of those people um, are, you know, some estimates as high as half are quote unquote out of control, even though we really do have very good, um, you know, kind of hard science about what, what ought to be the steps one would take to control their hypertension. So. If we move forward an additional slide, um, you know, the, the, the communication topic here, and again, what for me is caught up in this idea of moving from engagement, which to me implies something we do at somebody else versus empowerment, which is something that somebody chooses to do for themselves, is rooted potentially in a, a you know, sort of ships passing in the night, like communication failure between um, patient and provider. Patients may think they understand uh, what's involved with hypertension. Um, gosh, my reading was a little high that one day. I think I ran up the stairs very quickly, 
I don't like being in a position. Yeah, it was high that one day, right? But they don't really have a long-term understanding of hypertension and how hypertension might preclude their ability to have that emergency appendectomy that they might urgently need at a moment. And on the other side, providers might think they understand what's at play for patients when perhaps they don't understand what, what does success look like in the context of that patient's life? What are the opportunities and um, kind of degrees of freedom for change that are able not just to be employed for a short period of time, but we know hypertension is a condition that's gonna you know, be a marathon and needs to be a set of changes implemented over a long period of time. And so understanding what that mystery looks like with regard to how patients um, think about what they want might not be totally clear. So um, moving to our next slide, um, you know, we propose here, I propose a shared decision-making framework, um, which is broken down into these four um, uh, quadrants of the circle. Number one, diagnosis. Number two, measurement. Number three, risk factors. And number four, treatment. And I think this framework is possibly applied to any, um, any health condition, particularly chronic health conditions. But what I'm gonna to describe today is how we might apply this decision framework um, to hypertension. And I hope we'll have some, some good debate and, and discussion. So um, diving in, as we think about diagnosis, um, you know, some of the questions that come to play that might be relevant to a truly shared, not one, person kind of in charge and the other person trying to be on the receiving end of that, but something that actually has some uh, foundation of, of co-equal to it is, you know, what, what does it actually mean to be hypertensive? Um, and particularly with hypertension, I believe that uh, studies have shown that there's a lot of anxiety about a hypertension uh, diagnosis and, and even a sense of fault. I haven't lived my life in the right way. We have many, many stories through the um, uh, American Heart Association as an example, and I've been part of the American Heart Association for um, many, many years at a, at a board level where you know we celebrate, um, hey, this person made changes in their life and they no longer have to take medicine, which kind of implies that maybe before they made those changes in their life, they were doing something which cause them to be you know, somewhat at fault with regard to hypertension. So understanding what does that equation um, look like uh, to a patient. And then you know, I've given one example already, but what are the practical ramifications of high blood pressure left unmanaged? Um, do there, there are certainly um, uh, you know, much communication about you know, the long-term impact to kidney and heart you know, and these, these things, but it's possible Patients can think of that as some long-term down the road, not a problem today, as compared to there are absolutely real consequences of hypertension to things that could be very urgent and essential, like being able to have an appendectomy as an example, other kinds of either um, uh, elective or um, perhaps described as elective, but still quite urgent um, surgical procedures and other kinds of medical procedures. So really airing out um, you know, diagnosis is not just one high reading one day, right? It's a very thoughtful, very comprehensive diagnosis and making sure that's really shared and, and understood. The second topic of measurement um, is this idea that patients can, in fact, be empowered and educated and capable of taking their blood pressure. Um, we could fill many, many, many rooms with um, uh, Fitbit step counters that are, you know, sort of uh, sitting in people's drawers or, you know, sitting in a washing machine to uh, drive up the uh, step count or whatever it might be. And, you know, we all know how to get on a scale and take our weight, whether we'd like to do it or not, we know how to do it. Blood pressure, for some reason, has had a very, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, not, not necessarily as accessible that any of us should feel very confident and capable of taking our own blood pressure. And in fact, most studies, I believe at this point, prove that um, self-assessment of one's blood pressure is the most reliable means of establishing a blood pressure, that we've got potentially white coat phenomenon in a physician's office or the reverse. And um, really having a consistent practice of taking our own blood pressure, particularly for somebody who's been diagnosed as hypertensive, is important. And then I think very directly related to that is the use of automated cuffs. The technology has um, been you know, uh, very much improving, 
but I think there's still a lot of um, debate around, well, is that automated cuff as good as taking it with a manual um, uh, cuff? And, you know, can, can there be a methodology around consistent sharing of that data between provider and um, patient? Can that be agreeable? So I think this measurement topic, again, I think this applies to other chronic conditions as well, but particularly for hypertension, having a consistent protocol around measurement so that there can be sharing of decision making is, is super important. Uh, moving to category three, um, how do risk factors uh, impact the intensity of the treatment plan? So, um, you know, as, as we know, 90% uh, of the time, there's not a specific um, root cause that's being able, that, that one's able to assign to why somebody is hypertensive, but there certainly are risk factors that play into the likely trajectory of somebody's um, hypertension having to do with their uh, family history and, and genetics is obviously a key component of that. Um, there are, you know, a small number of other factors, including um, uh, how they eat, how they um, uh, consume uh, alcohol and other drinks and, and other kinds of things that absolutely is going to play a role in that. And, and that touches on another listed here as a risk factor, but, you know, sort of what are the norms that surround that person's day-to-day um, -day, uh, experience, uh, childhood, family, workplace? Are there certain pressures um, that will create um, uh, a topic with regard to how intensive a treatment plan is going to be required for that person to be able to be um, consistently in control with regard to their hypertension as they get older. And we know this is um, likely to be a progressive topic. Finally, just um, to give some examples with regard to treatment, um, starting a treatment conversation with a really thoughtful, non-judgmental, realistic conversation about what is what is a great shared goal and that goal certainly might be numeric uh, with regard to um, you know the actual measurement of the blood pressure but there might be other elements of the goal um, how confident are we that um, if medication is part of the treatment plan that um, side effects can be managed and there can be iterative changes to medication to ensure uh, or to at least have as a goal uh, an experience of that without um, uh, uh, consequential side effects, is a pharmacist um, uh, likely to be a part of the treatment plan and might information from that pharmacist be also part of, of the interaction? Many people are going to speak to their pharmacist, so is that taking place kind of outside of this framework or is that part of it? And then, you know, there's some extremely good tools, as I'm sure much of this audience is aware around being actually able to measure not only the pharmacological impacts, but the likely impacts of non-pharmacological proven um, methodologies like the DASH diet um, and, and um, you know, reduction in sodium and um, uh, cardiovascular exercise and aerobic activity, um, anaerobic activity, et cetera. So what is the full range of options in the context of this individual's diagnosis, measurement, and risk factors? And, you know, the acknowledgement that that treatment plan will need to change because as the person ages, their, their hypertension status may well change. So um, with that kind of as the background for um, a shared decision making, um, uh, I want to pause for a minute and uh, perhaps stay on this uh, slide that we're on right here with the question uh, coming in from the chat about where are the biggest challenges and where do we need to improve as a healthcare community from Johnny. Um, so Johnny, can I, can I engage you in the conversation? Do you, do you have a view of where you think the challenge is the greatest? He might not be able to um, to chime in audibly, Kathy, okay. but we could. Oh, I, I don't. So we may just be able to um, to have your to hear I your. your mm -hmm. Okay, I like my opinions the best anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I I'm a, for for all the chronic conditions that I've I've studied, um, I really feel like across the board, hypertension included, it all starts with the diagnosis somebody having a lot of confidence in the diagnosis is going to predicate a lot that comes from here. And, and I think particularly with hypertension, there's so much, um, uh, I think, well-intended, but partial information in the public domain, which has 
charts and they're banded and you know if you're 140 over x then you know you are this not not really what is the actual underpinning of a diagnosis which is 10 to 12 measurements taken in lots of different settings and lots of times a day that um, describe um, and really form the basis of a hypertension diagnosis and i think um, as an opportunity for kind of a do better which which john is asking about um, I think the, the gap between the real understanding of what is a rigorous diagnosis versus one measurement, one time that was high allows way too many people to kind of discount and say, well, you know, that was just that one day or that, that was just an anecdote, not really understanding that it's, it's quite a bit more that goes into a uh, diagnosis of, of hypertension. I also think that, um, you know, as we sit here today, uh, you know, two and a half years into a pandemic, I guess two years, mm -hmm. two and a half years, um, two years and change. Um, you know, there's there's just so many other sound bites out there that aren't helpful. Um, if if you eat mushrooms, you won't have hypertension. If you you know, they're just very um, incomplete, and I think it gives people, therefore, right at the get go, a very incomplete understanding to then really be able to participate in a rigorous and thoughtful, ultimately, treatment plans. So those are my thoughts. Agreed points. Thanks for, for answering uh, Johnny's quick comment there, Kathy. Good insight. And oh, then, here's another quick, yeah, on the flip side, where are the where are clinicians most challenged? OK, so I'm on that. I'm going to hold that thought for a mm -hmm. slide that's coming up, because I, I do think there's substantial challenges for this um, kind of idea for clinicians. Um, so, so if we advance a slide, um, and and you know if I've if I've sold to you effectively that you know the starting point is, you know described here as patient education, but again I view information as a um, as an elixir, as a you know catalyst for a different outcome. Um, information that's simple, digestible, where possible, numericized, and candid about what is it that's known and what is it that's not known um, that can be helpful. There's you know, a great many instances of hypertension diagnosis where the cause is not clear and it in no way, shape, or form indicates that it's that person's fault or problem um, or, or you know, that they've, they've been the, the reason for that, uh, just as one example. So very plain spoken clear. Um, one, one thing that I've always found interesting in hypertension is that, um, according to our overlord, Dr. Google, um, it turns out that people search the term hypertension with a great amount more volume than they do high blood pressure. And I see in that the idea that, um, uh, you know, the average patient is actually uh, quite able to use the accurate term to not be intimidated by necessarily all the medical terminology and knowledge that's out there. And so, um, you know, just reflecting on that and thinking about what's a not just kind of simplified set of sound bites, but a truly um, thoughtful overview of what is it, frankly, that we do and don't know about each of these components, diagnosis, measurement, risk factors, and, and treatment. And then, you know, just acknowledging that the decision points here of what goals are realistic and specific in the context of that individual's life, how frequently might somebody measure their blood pressure, uh, assuming they've become um, educated and equipped to be able to do that, being able to recognize um, and discuss what are meaningful changes and, and risk factors, and then ultimately prioritizing and planning for treatment in a, in a fashion that is sequential, not just one time. So if we move forward one more slide, Johnny, I think this will get to um, uh, uh, the, some of the questions um, that are out there. When I, when I stare at this uh, chart 13, I would say that clinicians, if I were a clinician, I might look at this and think about my patient load and wonder, do I really have the manpower and the resources to engage, let's say half of the patients in my practice are hypertensive to engage all of them in this kind of very deep and thoughtful approach that really would potentially be um, lead us to um, a different place. And, and again, I do think there's been 
um, multiple studies that have pointed to your shared decision making and communication and, and this kind of idea as a, you know, um, categorically better set of outcomes versus I'm in a hurry, I've got a script, I'm going to write down some medicine, I want you to take it, let me know if it's a problem and go on to the next patient, which um, could, could be the uh, experience for, for way too many of our patients. So I, I in, you know, full, fully recognize that as I look at one, two, three, four um, on this slide, that's, that actually would take, um, could take a significant amount of, of human capital and resource that may not be available to all practices. And so if we advance to the next slide, um, you know, how can technology and um, this context of um, empowerment changed the game. Uh, we, we sit here today with um, fantastically different technologies than we did in the year 1733 that um, blood pressure first started to be studied. Um, the opportunity around diagnosis to have on-demand learning where um, more of the actual underlying research of what is blood pressure um, there's podcasts, there's videos, there's research articles, there's um, longer pieces, shorter pieces, right? There's, there's plenty of good stuff, but sifting through all that, getting down to a small number that, that is relevant and helpful to understanding diagnosis for hypertensive patients. Measurement. Um, there are many, many now highly validated, automated cuffs that make the measurement topic um, honestly, very straightforward. Um, certainly the American Heart Association, the American Medical Association, there are many, many good resources that point people towards what does accurate measurement look like? Um, you know, sitting, not crossing your legs, um, you know, being quiet for a few minutes before you take the measurement, right? There are, there are very good resources that are available um, that, that people can become familiar with. And, you know, the opportunity for these automated cuffs to just instantaneously share a consistent set of measurement, which we know is, is really the heart of understanding if somebody is, is in control or not with, with a provider. Um, risk factors. Um, while there have been many, many studies about lots of different kinds of risk factors, I do believe that, um, that the risk factors of interest are a small, finite number, and those two could be the source of um, automation and, and interaction. And then finally, treatment. Um, you know, assuming that treatment involves something more than here's a script and take a pill, um, that there are a series of activities um, that could be part of an effective treatment plan and a reevaluation of treatment, um, potentially involving pharmacists as um, one goes uh, through their through their journey. So I, I think technologies could be potentially a big part, Johnny, of, of perhaps the solution to your question about where are clinicians most challenged. And then with regard to empowerment from a staff perspective, um, just, you know, again, the opportunity for all of that information to be available to care teams in a thoughtful, planful way that actually understands all of the topics that are potentially on a nurse's desk, that are potentially on a, a coordinator's desk so that, um, it's clear, boy, um, Kathy took the interactive quiz on measurement and she's, she's obviously terribly confused. Kathy needs to be the subject of a outreach and conversation as compared to Jen who aced the quiz and clearly is sending in lots of good information about her blood pressure measurements. Jen, Jen thanks, seems to be in good thanks shape. Thanks for giving me an A, good job. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I am sure that's um, honestly how it, would, how it would play out. So, um, you know, I think that's the potentially the unrequited um, opportunity where, you know, if, if we have studies that say, boy, shared decision-making communication sits at the top of the list around how would we take this very long understood issue and actually um, um, make change, then um, can we support that with technologies and platforms and modern day ways of fostering communication that would, that would allow that to be able to be achieved. So if we, I think we have maybe just one more slide, uh, which calls for Q&A. Perfect. So and we, I, mm -hmm. 
We do have a few other questions that were submitted prior. Kathy, I could share those with you now. And for those in the audience, I see some folks typing. Um, and actually, just a question came in from Nye, so we can cover that. Um, he asks, uh, are incentives aligned for providers to solve this? And are clinicians motivated to solve this? So, no, I, I, I certainly love, um, if you want to write in the chat as well, your thoughts on this. I mean, maybe implied in the question is, are the, are the incentives and motivation sufficient to really get our arms around what is a very consequential health issue? Um, the, the thing about hypertension, which um, uh, compared to other chronic conditions, um, you know, hypertension known as the silent killer, right? I mean, it can have a truly devastating impact uh, when not properly managed. And so um, we all, I'm sure, like to say that the understanding of that gives us all high incentive and motivation around um, uh, helping people get their hypertension in control. But at the same time, I do think the, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but the, you know, disjointedness of um, how might one interact consistently with a hypertensive patient when so many of the patients that are part of it, average practice are gonna be hypertensive. That could definitely be um, uh, overwhelming. I think from a, uh, as you point out, the fee for service world, um, you know, more touches maybe creates more profitability, but on the other hand, you know, there certainly are many, many um, practices and providers that are moving to a world of um, payment for outcomes. And when hypertension, as we know, complicates the um, trajectory of every other medical issue that somebody who has hypertension will, um, will face, um, I do think that there's, you know, a real opportunity here for um, a different approach. I'd be curious, now, if you also want to, you know, do, do you think um, many of these questions do come back to payers and, you know, are payers properly valuing the amount of time it might take to implement a truly shared decision making approach like this? And, um, you know, I, I do think that's an interesting question to see is, is, is that an area for change? That's a great point. I know I've, I've run into that which just from a, an anecdotal personal um, perspective with, with my father with multiple chronic conditions. You know, we'll leave the doctor's office, we'll have two visits and have 40 pages of paperwork. Um, and the doctor has all of eight minutes or whatever that time lo looks like for, for his provider. Um, that it, it does seem to prove to be a challenge sometimes um, to deliver all of that information um, and still make decisions in a timely manner. Um, so Dr. Dr. B, Dr. Bay, I apologize there. Feel free to correct me on pronunciation, but um, I can tell you I live in value-based care and outcomes do matter. And that's that's great to hear, Doctor. Um, that's definitely the case. We know folks, you know, Kathy, you know, feel free to speak to that. Yeah, no, I, I there's there's certainly a, a changing of the guard and a transition there. I I do wonder whether habits have changed to keep pace with that. There's a study that I read that said, um, ironically, the study was done 10 or 15 years ago, but that it takes 17 years for a fully understood and agreed improved healthcare change to become broadly adopted. So, you know, even if we today were to say, boy, this is the elixir, this is exactly how we should do it, you know, would it take 17 years? <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, uh, to get from here to there, almost, I wouldn't say regardless of the incentives, but um, sometimes getting that change underway can can take quite a long time. Excellent. I'd love to bring us back to your earlier slide in the deck where you, you were talking about the difference between engagement and empowerment. And that was actually a question we received uh, from one of the attendees prior. They said, uh, what do you see as the fundamental difference between patient engagement and empowerment? And isn't that just semantics? I, and it's a great question. And, and Ray, I don't know if you would maybe jump back to that slide. Um, it, it may be semantics, but I think words matter. And I think um, I 
coming from a, a previously I was CEO of a worksite wellness uh, company, and uh, you know we had a thousand employer clients. We worked with close to a million individuals annually, and the number of conversations that I had um, where engagement was used in a context of kind of engaging at somebody implies right we we all are sitting here with the answer and they those people need to engage in our answer versus what i might think of around empowerment which is a potentially more humble way of thinking about the world and a understanding that we um sitting here today possibly have a piece of an answer but we don't really have the other side of an answer and until we really um choose to look at this as, as um, something where, uh, you know, the real answers here of changing how people eat, changing how people uh, regard activity, changing how people um, uh, experience and have perspective on medication uh, and, and things of that sort, um, those are those can be complex topics, and they require somebody to uh, make a set of decisions about that. And I, I believe strongly that information and empowerment of that person to choose to make a decision that's a different one than where their um, current habits take them is uh, sits at the at the heart of what I think of when I think of empowerment, as opposed to engagement, meaning engage in somebody else's answer. That's a great segue, Kathy. Uh, one of the other comments we received kind of along that vein was that um, a statement, we have a regimen for explaining hypertensions to patients diagnosed with it, but you're saying that may not be enough. Is it a matter of repetition until it sinks in? Yeah, so I guess my presentation here today and, and thoughts is, is um, leading us towards an answer of no, I don't think just re repeating the regimen is the answer. I think the better answer is the, um, some of what we talked about at, uh, at the end of the presentation around multiple different ways of information being able to be accessed at the time and place of somebody's choosing. Um, the idea that, um, you know, we live in a world today where there's been an explosion of media. Um, maybe I want to listen to the podcast. Maybe I want to watch a long video. Maybe I want to watch a short video. Maybe I want to read an infographic. Maybe I want to read the actual research that's cited in dents and tables and graphs. Maybe I want, you know, and, and how could um, a curated set of resources allow somebody in breaking down sort of the topics into this framework of, do I, do I really have what they say I've had? What, what somebody else is telling me I have diagnosis. Do I really understand the measurement topic? And can I be you know, fully in charge myself of taking my own blood pressure? There's still many, many people who think they have to go to their doctor's office to get a blood pressure reading. Um, uh, and that's not to say people at home might have errors in how they take their blood pressure. But I think there's a there's the research would say that it's still better for somebody to learn how to self assess their, their own mm -hmm. blood pressure. Um, for somebody to come to terms with their own risk factors. Um, I actually am somebody who has um, hypertension. And, uh, you know, I got many, many great genetic gifts from my parents, <laughs> but not this one. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> that, you know, was one thing I'm sharing, but no problem. I'm, you know, that was something I had to come to terms with, regardless of other choices in my life. That's, that's something that I've been dealt. And then finally, you know, the consequences of the range of treatments that are available. Can I, can I participate in that? Or is that somebody's just going to hand me an answer of what I need to do? So. I see a comment from Rex there. Um, Rex, thanks for sharing that. That um, he says uh, many measurement points described as engagement stop at a singular event. Did they show up to an appointment, etc.? But empowerment can be measured over time with adherence to shared goals and patient satisfaction feedback. Empowerment has a more impactful sense to it. Oh well, thank you, Rex. I'm glad you uh, uh, like this term, and that's quite an eloquent and possibly, probably more eloquent than. Uh, than my thoughts on empowerment. But yes, empowerment is also intended to connotate that it's 
for a long period of time. We know hypertension and many chronic conditions are not a one and done phenomenon. There's something that, that really have to be um, part and integrated into somebody's life. Absolutely. One of the other interesting things, as Kathy, as I was listening to you and even hearing, you know, Rex and some of the other group um, conversation, you know, I think about too, even understanding from a, a caregiver or a family member perspective to empower us as family members who are caring for for elder folks or others with with these conditions. You know, I've been using our, our our calcium app with my father when I go to appointments, and it's actually helped empower me to make sure that he is understanding as well. Um, so I think there's this aspect of empowering patients, but also empowering families, which generally doesn't happen when you're handed, you know, sheets of paper and it doesn't go anywhere, it just sits on your desk. Um, if there can be that shared empowerment, that could be powerful as well. Yeah, that's a great also extension of the idea of empowerment as patient and their families. There are there are norms in uh, families where, boy, we always have a glass of wine with dinner. You know, we always um, uh, enjoy certain kinds of foods together because it's the holidays, because this is what we do. We always, right? And so um, the idea that somebody on their own is going to make these choices versus interrogating kind of and helping to set the stage for what is the support system around that individual to make different kinds of choices so that they are truly enduring choices and not just um, you know something one did for a short period of time and then found themselves fatigued by those choices, not any other support around them. And then Jen, to your point, you know, being able to kind of within those eight minutes uh, in the physician's office, uh, which has actually also been studied, how you know short that that window is. Um, people feeling prepared and having information to be able to, to uh, make those questions, I think, is is important as well. Definitely. If if uh, anyone has a, any other comments, there we're we're starting to wind down to a close. Uh, but you know, I wanted to share just kind of on the next slide, speaking to you know. It, personal experience, but also, you know, kind of our goal at Calcium is to enable those health decisions, enable folks. And I can speak to Kathy, as you talked about making sure in those eight minutes that the um, the patient has enough information to take action and understand uh, what, what steps they need to take and what should I be doing and measuring. And it can be overwhelming. Uh, and I can say as a, a care provider, I've actually been able to use this you know, seeing uh, what my dad's measurements are, even using, I captured some journal notes um, when he was at a, an appointment and realized that there were some some numbers that didn't line up and he actually shouldn't have this kidney test because it could have caused harm to his body. Um, and being able to have all of that and be empowered was very powerful um, from the patient perspective, but also from the provider perspective, being able to see all of these observations, the, the number of conditions that are covered and how adherent folks are to flag them, to care for them. That's all something that, that our tool does. Um, I know you've worked with us even on a hypertension pathway, if you wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, here as we close up and uh, get to any other lingering questions, you know, love to hear about your experience about, you know, what is it, has it been like to create a hypertensive pathway versus more of the, versus a traditional means of delivering that? Um, thank you for, for that invitation, Jen. And yes, it's been a total privilege to work with the Calcium team to build out a pathway that, that does try to take this conceptual idea and really practically break down the world, look at the resources that are available and for each of these four phases, diagnosis, measurement, risk factors, treatment, um, go out in the world and find communication um, vehicles and points of interaction that are connected to that pathway. And so um, the pathway itself is a five week sort of preset um, I guess you could think of it potentially as a curriculum, but again, it's got a lot of um, interaction built into it, a lot of freedom for the individual to um, choose from various resources um, based on their preferences for audio, video, depth, less depth, um, and um, uh, participate in a series of quizzes at each step. Um, that are there to be helpful to that person and to their care provider to ascertain where is that person in this journey? Do, do they really have a good understanding of primary hypertension? 
Um, do they have confidence and a means to measure their blood pressure consistently? Um, is there um, uh, the introduction of these risk factors so that the intensity of the treatment plan is connected to that set of risk factors? And then finally, um, you know, a, a set of uh, reflections for the individual to be able to kind of codify their input around given given now the knowledge around what what is the efficacy of different treatment options what is their perspective on a goal and as and a way to get there that they could interact with their care provider around and then make commitments towards the implementation of that treatment path so um i i think there's as, as i said at the beginning um you know, hypertension is meant to be an example of this framework. Um, we think it's applicable to many chronic conditions, but certainly hypertension is, is one where there is so much agreement on the basic science and options around hypertension that um, really, to me, the new day, the new dawning of being people being able to kind of interact with their care provider is a, is a, is a great place to really see if we could put this shared decision uh, framework to work. A great way to to kind of bring it full circle, Kathy. Uh, you know, thank you so much for for sharing your insights uh, to those who were able to submit questions, engaging in a dialogue. We appreciate some really rich discussion, Kathy. Thank you for for answering and covering all of those comments and questions. For for those who would wish to see a recording, we will have it available. Uh, there will be a link sent out following this webinar. So thank you again, Kathy, for, for sharing your insights with us today and for everyone who attended. And we uh, feel free to message us if there's any questions. We would love to continue this conversation with you. Uh, and feel free um, to reach out, as mentioned, and we will uh, hopefully be in touch with you with that link. And we hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their afternoon. Thank you all so much for uh, this. And Jen, thanks for the opportunity to you and Kelsey. It's great to be here. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.